You're listening to Inside Content, the TV industry podcast. This show is brought to you by 3Vision, a global TV industry consultancy specializing in content acquisition, strategy, research, and business development. Each episode, we give you VIP access to the views and experiences of senior TV executives and discuss the latest TV industry trends and insights. With regard to our strategy, we consider fast the next step in the evolution of our content distribution. There is so much content out there and the audience is inundated by choice. And sometimes as content programmers, content owners, we feel a little bit like we're looking through a fogged window and an audience saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do next? So for us, it's not simply about adding more channels, but it's about improving and strengthening our existing portfolio of compilation and single IP channels. I don't think it's about volume and adding more and more channels. As Fast matures away from being a nascent Wild West into an established area of business for the world of TV and streaming, how are major players keeping up and evolving their content strategies? Hello and welcome to another episode of Inside Content. I'm Jed Aloff, analyst at 3Vision, and this week we're bringing you our second edition of The Best in Fast, featuring some of the best conversations from the rapidly growing Fast space. Initially seen as an opportunity to monetize lower value content that had already been exhausted in multiple windows, it has now evolved into a market of additional opportunities and revenue streams for many players in the industry. With the increased amount of premium content and high value IP launching and fast, platforms are becoming ever more selective about what they acquire. In this episode, we'll be revisiting some of the discussions we've had with three of our guests who have given their perspective on what content works best for fast. Beth Anderson, General Manager of Fast Channels for BBC Studios, Valerio Motti, VP of Fast Channels at Fremantle, and more recent guests, Pauline Coglin and Ben Frey from Samsung TV+. Kicking off the episode, we look back on our conversation with Fremantle's VP of Fast Channels, Valerio Motti, who is responsible for over 10 Fast Channels, the majority being single IP, including well-known titles like Grand Designs and American Idol. In conversation with our CEO, Toby Russell, Valerio discusses why single IP channels are so powerful, but also the challenges that come with them. I think the first first topic I'd like to just talk about, and it's kind of based on our, I mean, our observation, looking at the fast market, there are more and more channels available. And I think in the US market, there's probably at least 1,500 channels, probably more. Um, there are more being developed every day. What, in your view, and based on your experience so far, what what do you think are the secrets of secrets of success for a channel? You know, to be honest, I don't think there is a single secret recipe for for success. But definitely, there are several uh, things that need to be in place uh, to make sure that the channel would be successful. First of all, uh, and I think it's the most important, is that you need to create a credible, you need to create a quality channel with great content. So that's, you know, number one. We have a very large catalog. I would say we have a huge catalog of shows and brands that are loved and known around the world. And therefore, our strategy is to create a mix of single IP, single title channels, as well as uh, genre channels. Obviously, having known brands like, you know, Jamie Oliver or Baywatch or Good Talent really helps. You need to have a good, a great affiliate relationship uh, with the platforms because uh, obviously all the fast pla- uh, channels, uh, they're distributed to, to fast platform and you need to have good relationship with them. Got you. Great, great, great. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about the um, different kind of types of of channel. And certainly, you know, we've had a lot of feedback from people operating in this space that single IP or maybe single show channels, whatever you want to choose to call them, are are working particularly well. Like, for example, the Baywatch channel that that you operate. Is, Is that your experience that those kind of single IP channels work better than a channel which is a, a collection of um, you know several different types of content, multiple series, for example. I think both type of channels have pros and cons. So uh, I think it's interesting to note that Fremantle uh, has been in the fast space for quite some time, and the first channel that we launched, that was in two thousand and eighteen, 
and it was and it's called buzzer and it's still you know still going on strong in the United States is a is a genre channel. So our first channel was a genre channel. We have, for example, let's take it as an example UK. We have a strong partnership with uh, with Samsung, where we have launched in partnership with them some uh, very strong single title channels like American Got Got Talent, American Idol, Project Runway, uh, Baywatch. Jamie Oliver. From our experience, um, single title channels are generally very quick to take off and require less marketing effort uh, to to describe what's in the channel. So for people to understand what's in the channel. I'll give you an example. When we have a channel called the Baywatch channel, it is already clear that people will find Baywatch episodes in it. So that makes for user uh, that makes it super easy for users to understand what the channel is about. But you know, from our experience, also genre channels are very popular. Therefore, I wouldn't say that one is more popular than the other. I say it's important to have a, a balanced mix of both. So I guess there is a danger with a potentially with a single IP channel that that might kind of wear out more quickly in that you know it's just one series and i guess it could be a lot of episodes of the series but it's it's fundamentally the the same proposition you know all the time whereas a genre channel has got more diversity um in terms of the in terms of the content do you think do you think that's uh you know do you think that's that's that that would be the case i think that's a danger with single ip channels that it might be difficult to kind of keep them um on the platforms like all the time they might need to be rested and then brought back or is it is it just too early in the market to really tell that i mean from a logical point of view i would believe that you know at some point a single title channel will uh, will need to to rest a bit but at the moment is is too early to say because every month we have in all the platforms where where we are present with single title channels Every month, there's so many new users that enter the platform and that, you know, experience our channel, our single title channel for the first time that it's difficult to say, you know. So you don't need to rest it. It's new to them anyway. They don't, they don't... <laughs> exactly. Then obviously, there's going to be a completely different uh, scenario when the platform are going to reach, um, like, you know, uh, maturity. Yes. And, you know, in, in the platform, there's going to be the certain number of users that, you know, more or less is what the platform has achieved and, and will maintain in the future and then it's going to be much easier to tell to to answer this question which is how long does it take for a single title to to start losing the appeal for the public for, at the moment we're not able to i'm not able to give you an answer on that okay got you got you and then in terms of in terms of genres do you have a feel yet for what particular types of genre uh, are best suited to fast, and what types of genre might not be right for fast? Yes, so we 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 have several conversations with platforms all over the world, and you know we did thanks to this conversation, we understood that there are certain genres that are very popular on such platforms. News, for example, is very popular. Movies is very popular. Entertainment very popular. Work, works very well and fast. So in addition to our single title channels, we decided to focus on five genres in the entertainment uh, area of, uh, of uh, uh, the platform ZPG. So the first genre we focused on was food. Uh, in food, we, we have a channel called Cook Chop Chat, and it's, it's, a, it's a very nice channel. It has over 500 hours of celebrity chefs and cooks. We have an home improvement channel called Places and Spaces, over 1,500 hours of some of the best architecture, interiors, and home-related programming. We just launched a crime channel called Sleuth. And uh, it has a, really a lot of hours um, of some of the best UK crime and police and detective uh, series. So those are like primarily classic, you know, UK UK dramas. Correct. In the crime crime sector. Yeah. And then we have a comedy channel called Quip, and again, uh, six hundred hours of the best 
British comedy and sitcom and sketches. So we're talking about series like The IT Crowd, uh, The People Just Do Nothing, Birds of a Feather. And also this has been launched recently, so we're tracking it. And of course, we have our game show channel, which is called Buzzer. And in Buzzer, you know, there's many different game shows uh, that go into the channel. And it's probably one of the most popular channels that, that, that we've launched and that we have to date. And I guess there's quite a lot of effort involved in creating the actual channel brand. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's a, you know, that's, that, I guess that's considerable more kind of, you know, time and investment and brain power that goes into that um, compared to a single IP channel, because then that's already, that's already all done for you. Yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it, it requires a bit more creative input to decide what type of content is going to go into the channel. Do you, do you try typically to come up with genre channels that are going to work on a global basis? Or are you thinking about, you know, this channel work in this one particular market and then in another market, we might have to have a different um, you know, a different name or a different approach or a different content mix. Yeah, we try to think globally. But then, of course, uh, in some cases, we certain global brand may not work in all the countries in the world. So we are also very flexible and uh, we, are, we are, you know, prepared to act locally as well. Right, got you. And I guess you also have to deal with the issue of localization in terms of having dubbed or subtitled versions of the content and probably localized on-air graphics and that kind of thing also. Yeah, we believe that uh, a successful channel is a fully localized channel. So our channels are 100% programmed in local language. If we have strong local IP, it makes sense for the local IP to be inside of a specific genre channel, then that local IP will be in the specific genre channel. So. They're, you know, they're global channels, but with uh, with a strong local flavor when possible. Next, we head back to our episode with our VP, Hayley Bull, in discussion with Beth Anderson of BBC Studios. Beth gave us insight into the shift towards newer content, programming strategy, and again, why single IP channels tend to perform so well. We've heard that single IP often perform very well, but I could see how that can start to change over time. Are there any learnings? You said you've been in this business nearly five years now about the types of channels that perform well, or is it a really case of varies by platform territory? Um, I, I think the reason why single IP channels continue to perform well um, is down to the humans who schedule it. Um, I think the danger with a single IP channel is if you uh, algorithmically program it um, or you do what we would call in the industry zombie channel it and you have the same episodes airing on a really, really frequent basis. Um, you can air the same episode multiple times on a single series IP channel. So you don't mm-hmm. have to have um, an infinite supply of new content for a channel. I mean, you, you, you heard me talk about the classic Doctor Who channel there. There literally cannot be any more of that. That is a, a finite number of episodes in a finite group of, of years. Um, but uh, being able to find reasons to celebrate different content at different times um, by putting really smart and passionate people behind it, as I'm lucky to have over at BBC, and I know a lot of our industry partners also have um, that scheduling expertise, really allows for an ebb and flow of channel performance um, to avoid what we call the kind of the dip, um, where, where you might have a single IP channel perform really, really well for the first couple of months, and then people kind of yeah. feel like they've consumed it, and then it'll disappear off. Um, we've had really consistent performance for up to five years on some of these channels, um, and that I do put entirely down to the type of marathoning, the type of data analysis that we do the type of listening and iteration maybe even on different platforms and recognize that we have different audiences coming in in different mood states um, on different platforms so we're allowing um, a, a different celebration to be the case so with our classic Doctor Who channel for example um, we can do things like you know celebrating birthdays or anniversaries of specific ep- episodes um, but also you know draw, draw parallels to the time of year or, or certain seasonality that is very prevalent that can also kind of link in with, uh, with our other um, our other channel strategies. 
So it's really about staying present and not taking it for granted that you just have one piece of IP. It's really like a think inside the box strategy. Yes, you have parameters. You're looking at just one type of show, but there's so much play that you can do within that. And it's about bringing that curiosity and strength of mind in the scheduling process. That's really interesting because I I was always um, sort of concerned that with single IP, it may be a case that you run out <laughs> and, and you, you know, you can't do that many repeats for, for, for so long, but your clever scheduling clearly is the answer to that. Well, right. And we did have a really nice example of some A-B testing there, right? So we have Classic Doctor Who on one hand, finite number of episodes, and we have Antiques Roadshow, mm. which is currently airing show. So we're able to mm. see, you know, w- which one performs better. Um, and, and of course, there is a, a wonderful thing about having new content. I'm always appreciative of, of, of having a, 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 an investment in continuing treasured IP like Antiques Roadshow. But we are able to see both channels perform well and we don't templatize too much. So we, the, the strategy that we take on Classic Doctor Who isn't the same as Antiques Roadshow. To your point, it does change dependent on the type of IP that you have and, and the type of programming that you're looking at. Um, uh, but if you do have new programming, obviously we celebrate that and, and, and that's something that we we definitely enjoy. But there is a way of, of creating a really long life cycle. And I think the reason why that exists where that concept exists and why you have such high repeatability is because we've uh, lived in a world where an audience has been introduced to binging for almost two decades at this point. Um, It was prevalent in DVD where people would buy DVD box sets. And then of course, in the wonderful world of SVOD, we've really introduced marathoning and audiences really enjoy um, the comfort and familiarity of watching something they already know. There isn't that same fear of repeatability or tiredness um, that you might have seen in a traditional TV linear space in the pay TV world. Fast initially has been quite synonymous with older titles. We hear lots of discussion in the industry about fast enables archive content to be reserviced. And, and looking at some of the, the channel content, arguably it is heavy, heavily weighted towards catalogue. But we're seeing some examples of newer content coming through. When do you think there's going to be a, a shift in that trend? Oh, I, I think it's happening right now. And I, you know, we we certainly are doing it. It really depends on the type of channel. And you know, it's it's funny, the catalog piece is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it became a, a synonymous term with fast, fast is catalog and catalog is fast. And I I, I absolutely appreciate that. And it's wonderful um there's lots of reasons to be just full of delight that we can find an outlet for some of our shows that um have never met a certain audience and bring audience and content together in in weird and wonderful ways but um it was also because it was a business development initiative to begin with in the industry at large and so we w- the industry at large wouldn't have put new shows in a format that was untested um, for returns. So, you know, the majority of this business is performance based um, in terms of the economics behind it. So that would have been a very, very big bet early on. As a result, the majority of the programming was catalog in nature for pure business economics. Um, And as the business has grown in in both uh, revenue awareness, but also in reach awareness, you're starting to see companies becoming a lot more bullish in the type of programming that they're putting out there. And, you know, we're lucky in a sense, especially in the US, because we have more content than we have channel partners um, and uh, channel interests. So we do have the ability on, say, food and home to air shows that have never had a platform in the States before. So we're already doing it, already kind of premiering in that space. And I think that that's really leaning into to, to a world in which we can recreate among especially younger audiences who aren't part of the the cable universe on the pay tv space and now you know you're looking at about half of the u.s population that doesn't have access to pay tv at all um to recreate that water cooler moment that ability to celebrate a, a show that you otherwise wouldn't wouldn't find and and of course we we have that in the SVOD space already but um i think there is an immediacy and um a, an access um inside the fast space that allows for um new programming to be discovered and um, a lot of people to find it both in their own time and at the same time. I'd just like to talk about localization for a bit. And you mentioned earlier that I think you have your kids channel um, now distributed in, in Spanish, which is which is fantastic. When we speak to various distributors and platforms that are working in fast, um, 
especially those in non-English speaking markets, there seems to be um, a trend that it's becoming more and more important that content is localized and that subs doesn't necessarily work um, in certain markets. Again, does the BBC have access to plenty of localized content to be able to fulfill some of those platform requirements? Or is it simply that the return on the investment to do that, to localize some of those shows, just wouldn't be where you need it to be at the moment? Uh, I wish I had a plethora of localized assets and, uh, you know, it, it, we don't, we definitely don't have enough. And I don't think the industry has enough overall. Um, I think it's particularly interesting when you look, as we have done, inside a, a an English speaking market that does not have English as its, as its only language in the US, um, to see where we can serve the audience. And, and in terms of return on investment, it's such an interesting question because, yes, of course, we always have to balance our books and look at the economics. But I celebrate fast as the most equitable form of media in a generation. I've said it a couple of times, but I really do believe that we're increasing access to programming to audiences that otherwise have not had access before. We've had a very elite form of media with various different paywalls in the past. And here we have something that is immediate and free um, that does create access for uh, minority audiences or audiences that have felt like they have been marginalized in the past. And I think, you know, that's why we've been so keen to celebrate Spanish language programming when we do have it, um, but we certainly don't have enough. And it is a challenge because we don't want to create assets that aren't um, suitable. We don't want to do it in a way that is cost effective to the, the detriment of quality. And so it is about finding and listening and seeing where we can um, play um, in the space in a way that is economically efficient, but also ultimately meets the uh, language interests. Um, I would also say, so we've got our, our, our BBC Kids channel in, in Spanish, and I, I forgot to mention that we also have a Top Gear in Spanish as well. Um, one language isn't always just one language. You know, we have a neutral Spanish um, for Latin America, and we have Castilian Spanish in European Spain. Um, so uh, it is it is always a challenge to kind of find where the right play is and make sure that we're we're meeting the needs of our of our audience. Um, the the other thing I think is if, you, if we're not looking inside one uh, country where multiple languages do exist, and it's not just Spanish that exists in in, in the US, there are multiple. Um, if you do look at something where that that language is the majority language, so say German in Germany, um, it is imperative that you use German assets, of course, um, and we do. And so we have you know multiple channels in Germany that are in German. We are using assets that already exist, and we're not yet at the point of being able to you know commit. Um, but I think we're really paying attention to how each different market responds to the world of fast. And each market in each language has a different cultural heritage in the TV space. So how fast manifests isn't going to be the same way that it's manifested in the US. And we're kind of looking at the market to see where we can make those investments before we, you know, go fully into the space of localizing everything. It's also, you know, like I mentioned, we have 100 years of programming. So a little bit of focus on what, where are, where we should put our investment is, 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 is necessary. And so we're looking at, you know, where the natural interests are arising out of our existing catalog of assets before investing fully. Well, it'll be an interesting opportunity then to talk about platforms and how they're differentiating themselves. I mean, we're, we're seeing, you know, an increasing number pop up from across the industry, whether it's kind of those owned by the big media conglomerates, kind of independent third party, those run by the, the OEMs. How how are platforms differentiating themselves, Beth, and, 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 and how can you take advantage of some of that? So things like exclusivities, um, newer premium content, what, what things are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, we we are absolutely seeing differentiation among the platforms. It's interesting because it's not necessarily deliberate. Um, it's partly the result of the buying experience of the device. It's partly due to the watching experience in the household. Um, the majority of fast as we believe it to be, because actually, you know, the, the real secret about the fast world is that we don't have enough data to necessarily prove exactly where people are watching, but we believe people are watching in the living room predominantly. 
um, uh, suggests that there is uh, opportunity for co-viewing um, versus single uh, viewer. And you do see different viewer behaviors as a result of that different experience. You might see a slightly truncated um, watch time in a co-viewing household if you have multiple generations watching at the same time versus a single viewer that might, uh, you know, start off in a fast environment and then ping off into an AVOD space or an SVOD space to watch for longer periods of time. We live in a world where there is so much content out there um, and we the the audience is, is, is inundated by choice. And sometimes as content programmers, content owners, we sort of feel a little bit like we're looking through a fogged window and an audience saying, what are you going to do? What are you going to do next? We're, we're here. We're ready. What do you want to do? And it's a lot of pressure on our audience. So I think that the fast model of just having something playing that is editorially scheduled by someone who's really passionate about a subject, it's quite high appeal to an audience member who might be tired, um, a bit exhausted, doesn't want to choose. Um, and just wants to relax into an environment. That's why you have a lot of comfort viewing um, television programming inside this model in general. Um, and so we do try and meet the mood of our audience. And regardless of, you know, which demographic they fit into, um, find something that is enjoyable and accessible and not too demanding to watch. Um, and so we create um, schedules that that kind of flow very easily um, and don't uh, don't provide too much kind of disruption. Um, as a result. So it is it is definitely um, something that is organic and iterative. We definitely are seeing differences. And when you you know speak about exclusivity early on there, I think exclusivity is one word. I think um, you know, customization is another. We're really interested in super serving a, a platform that we're working with and programming to where we're seeing natural instincts happen inside that user base, inside that viewership, and also inside that advertiser um, uh, viewership as well. So where, where we have an advertiser partner inside a platform um, versus another one, we might want to program sympathetically to that type of advertiser um, versus uh, a, a, another service that might have a slightly more a, a bigger sense of immediacy or more action um, and, and a slightly more um, slow pace on, on another service. So I think we're going to start to see more iteration happening across the, the platforms, not just from the kind of um, bullish nature of business development where you tend to find people wanting to do exclusivity, but also from that more um, rolling hills, organic um, sense of, okay, well, we are appealing to a different audience there than we are on this other platform. And so we will program separately. Um, and so that's what we're really looking to do right now is really listen to the audiences on these different platforms and see where there is natural opportunity for exclusivity and also natural opportunity for customization. Finally, we're ending with a section of conversation from a recent episode with two guests from Samsung TV+. Plus: Pauline Coughlin, European Licensing Lead, Benedict Frey, Country Lead DAC. They discuss content acquisition strategy, what content works best from a platform perspective, and also the importance of localization. There's a huge amount of interest at the moment in what Samsung are, are doing from across the industry. So we're grateful to have you join us and, and share some of your, your insights with us and our listeners. Um, I'm aware kind of Samsung's activities are varied and fast, so I thought it would be helpful to get a short overview on what Samsung are doing with your TV product, Samsung TV+. Plus. Absolutely. Hi, Hayley. Um, so Samsung TV Plus is Samsung's free ad-supported streaming video service. It's available on all Samsung devices. Um, and then currently we have around um, 2,000 plus channels globally on 500 million devices globally. Thank you, Pauline. That's great. Let's start with content strategy. Tracking some of your activity with TV Plus, we can see that there are multiple ways that you're working with content providers from third party channel acquisition to licensing deals for owned and operated, which, which you look after, Pauline. Could you talk to some of the ways that you are collaborating with, with content owners, Pauline? Sure. Um, so from an O&O perspective or, or licensing point of view, we work with content partners that, that need to deliver in accordance with our own internal content strategy. We seek premium content, content that's recognisable with a recognisable cast. So no surprises there. Um, we also seek content that will resonate with the viewer in each country. 
Um, and as a content provider, if you only have a small library of content, we can still license your content uh, to be scheduled into one of our compilation channels. So that's one of the key differences. You don't have to have a vast library uh, of content to work with Samsung. Additionally, um, on the licensing side, you know, we will do the heavy lifting for our partners. So from curation through to scheduling, um, incorporation of the ad furniture. So it's a real um, end to end process. Great. So there are there are multiple points of entrance to work with Samsung as a content provider. You can take their content and, and use that in your owned and operated channel. Or you could take a, a third party channel and, and getting involved in licensing content and managing channels versus letting someone else just give you the feed and just taking a share of the, the revenue or inventory as you would with a third party is kind of a whole different ball game and is is kind of arguably new territory for, for Samsung. Um, are you likely to increase your strategy um, kind of in terms of the, the volumes of O&Os that you have? Um, how, how do you see that evolving as part of your kind of overall strategy, Pauline? So, um, so just to outline, as of today, um, we have over 40 channels across Europe that we either schedule or license content for. Um, content can be licensed on an exclusive basis, so that will usually tick the premium box for us. Um, recent examples of channels only available on Samsung are our compilation channels that I alluded to earlier. So, for example, in Spain, we have Todo Crimen, which is a true crime and scripted crime channel. In Germany, we have Comedy Mix, which is a scripted comedy channel and stand up. And then in the UK, we have um, channels like the Jamie Oliver channel, um, which is a, a channel um, collaboration with over, over 20 years worth of programming from Jamie Oliver's back catalogue. So all of Jamie Oliver's um, content is in one place or you can eat for, for want of a better expression um, and then we also have things like um, America's Got Talent and American Idol which historically were only available on Netflix so there's been lots of step change in what we've been doing in licensing over the last few years um, so in 2024 we want to build on those successes continue to look at what's working what needs improving to raise the channel bar further? So for us, it's not simply about adding more channels, but it's about improving and strengthening our existing portfolio of compilation and single IP channels. Um, I, I don't think it's about necessarily volume and adding more and more channels. Yeah. Additionally, we have a soft ceiling and that, that's across the whole of Europe. We have a soft ceiling of a certain number of channels per market. Um, to avoid overwhelming audiences and ensure the content is also still easy to navigate through. And what content is working well? Can you can you speak to that, whether it's kind of on a territory basis or a, a genre basis? Because I can imagine that because of the reach of Samsung and the success of the platform, you are inundated by requests from content owners and distributors to, to talk to you about what you could potentially do together. So there's two parts of this question, kind of what content is working well uh, and how do you decide kind of um, what content distributors and owners that you, you want to review and want to work with? Yeah, uh, very good question. Let me take the, the first part of the question then I hand over uh, to Pauline uh, for what content we are taking. So uh, what's working well across EU5 um, or across the board in Europe, we can say that uh, mainstream contents um, are working very well, like um, news, movie series, uh, Pauline mentioned before, cooking channels, uh, sport channels, and uh, also kids channels are working very well. So um, these are um, the ones which work well. We see also single IP channels uh, working very well. Like in Germany, for example, we have the Baywatch channel. Also in some other territories, we have it. Um, but also the, the ZDF Studios TerraX channel we are having in Germany uh, works very well. Uh, furthermore, we um, we have also some, um, some call it niche contents. Um, which work very well. Um, just to point out some examples uh, from the from the Dach region. So we have uh, the first fully localized uh, 
uh, Bollywood channel live since a month and it work, it's working extremely well together with C1. Uh, and uh, furthermore, we have um, opened up a complete new genre in uh, on TV Plus in Germany. We had it already in France with, a cha- with one channel, but now we opened up a complete new genre in Germany for the anime uh, genre, which is uh, working very well. And we will continue uh, to to do the next steps in all these genres. So, Pauline, what about the content we want to acquire? Yeah, so I think from from my perspective, we would um, firstly, we look at, you know, the current proposition across Europe, what's working well. Um, And we also can tune into, you know, complete data set across 24 countries globally um, to help inform our decisions on what to acquire. it's really a rich source of data for us, um, very valuable, enabled to maximize our efforts across acquisitions, editorial, um, even the scheduling of the channel and, and also marketing. So we're looking at varying programming types and genres, which will keep the fast audiences engaged and drawn in. And we can also, um, we look at test testing and featuring genre strands on our entertainment channels in the UK and Germany. So in the UK, uh, one of our flagship O&O channels is Entertainment Hub. And in Germany, we have our flagship entertainment channel, which is called Entertainment Mix. So that's another um, great test for us in able to really test what works well and expand out on those genres where, where needed. But, you know, it, it, it's all of the genres you'd expect that, that does well, entertainment and, and crime, cooking and, and things like that. So we really are, are testing before we expand those efforts. Fantastic. I imagine there's many in the industry who are very envious of that data set that you guys have access to and, and would love to get our hands on it to, to, ha- to have a look at it. But you mentioned, Benny, single IP channels are, are good performers. Do you think the reason for that is as simple as kind of signposting? So from a discoverability perspective and marketing, it's very clear when you go on to the guide for a, a audience member to understand what that channel is and, and click on it. Do you think it's as simple as that? Yeah, I think so. It's uh, that simple. Uh, we also recommend all our content partners uh, who are not doing a single IP channels that they be as simple and direct uh, when it comes to the, to the channel name and channel branding. Uh, because uh, obviously EPG is one of the major entry points um, uh, for our for our service. Uh, so therefore, anything which is simple and clear from our uh, branding perspective works pretty well. Great. Just to wrap up this section on, on kind of content strategy, um, sports content kind of often cited as as being kind of the most important content in terms of customer acquisition. And I see that, you know, you have many relationships in this regard. And actually in the last few days, um, a couple of new ones have been announced. I see you've extended your relationship with DAZN um, and also PGA. Do you see, Bene, that this is an area that you're going to continue to push on with? It obviously sounds like it's been been working because you've in, in, in extended these partnerships. Yeah, to give you uh, a pretty straight uh, answer, yes, uh, we will uh, further expand uh, in this uh, genre. And um, uh, it is a very important one. We see this in all our countries where we have premium sports live uh, and it uh, also works very well. But just to give you a couple of examples, what we are doing already and what we are having uh, on a pan-euro Uh, level uh, already live and um, not only live within the service but also live in terms of um, live sports which is always the differentiator right so um, as you said pga uh, we just launched them Uh, we have la liga uh, we just launched them in spain um, um, like the the spanish league and their own fast um, uh, proposition we have already since a couple of years live the tennis channel including a lot of live content um, from different tournaments. We have, uh, on a pan-euro level, um, we have also uh, motorsports channels live with live races uh, in different um, areas. We have FIFA Plus live since the last World Cup, Women's World Cup, uh, which works also very well across the board. And uh, we have then the, the overarching, let's say, the zone partnerships, but because just from a pure channel amount on a pan-euro level, 
Um, that's the biggest partner at the moment. Um, so we have different DAZN uh, channels um, in different countries in Europe. Um, we have uh, the zone women channels. Uh, so in Germany, that's called the zone rise with the uh, UEFA Champions League, uh, women's UEFA Champions League live on, on our service, um, which is a really buzzing um, uh, sport uh, and movement at the moment, uh, which is good uh, for us and good for the different leagues. Um, and then we have, uh, let's say, our highlight uh, channel um, which we uh, launched last year in December that's the zone fast plus uh, exclusively in Germany and uh, Austria where we have uh, live football games from the Spanish league every weekend the uh, French league and the Italian league and always only the top uh, games so we don't uh, have like uh, uh, the last uh, two playing against each other but more like the Barcelonas the Real Madrid and the PSGs um, playing against each other um, on our service live plus the UEFA Champions League show uh, which we have on Monday exclusively and um, shot in a specific uh, studio, a TV Plus studio by the zone and on Friday with all the highlights of the Champions League uh, match day with all goals and interviews. So um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, just looking into sports, um, what's happening and uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, there's uh, so much more uh, coming around. It's an extensive offer and I think the important point is that there's a lot of live content in there. This isn't just kind of archive library shows. It, 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 you know, there's, 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 there's live sports there. Super, super interesting. Um, I want to talk a bit about kind of localization as I have two European specialists on, on the pod with me. Um, like with much of our industry, the video landscape is very different outside of the U S and with fast, this is no exception in Europe, they're kind of distinct market characteristics, meaning that the, the fast market is developing very differently and presenting some unique challenges and, and opportunities. In Europe, we have a strong free TV offer, meaning that kind of often local TV dominates and lots of popular content is, is only available via those free TV services. We have multiple languages presenting challenges with localization for distributors, with subtitling and, and dubbing. What do you think, Pauline, needs to happen to make the EU grow fast? I was trying to avoid using that pun, but I just couldn't think on my feet for a better word. <laughs> what do you think needs to happen to make it grow at the same rate as the US? Or are we not likely to see that? Um, I mean, I think you've you've summarised it actually quite perfectly in your in your uh, question because. You know, to your point, um, you know, historically, the US has been a predominant pay TV market. So adoption has been much quicker. Um, also, one one main language. So there are already two huge hurdles because Europe is obviously um, multiple language. Also, many strong free to air markets uh, within Europe. So it's, you know, the fast proposition in Europe needs to stand out to, to gain traction and to your point, grow faster. So I think it's vital for 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 for, for fast services to grow, uh, or to try and catch up. I don't know if we will ever catch up, but to grow, I think you know, content has to be acquired um, to resonate with local audiences. So whether from a licensing perspective, we license content that is in local language, or it, it's dubbed or subbed. All of our O and O channels um, are will resonate with local audiences, and they have, um, you know, all, all channels are localized. So we are starting to see, um, you know, there there will always be constant growth, um, which makes sense because TV Plus is pre-installed on all devices, and everybody who buys a new TV buys a smart TV. So our potential reach uh, continues to grow, and we can see and we see adoption increasing in terms of our monthly active users. So there will always be growth there. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside Content, the TV industry podcast brought to you by 3Vision. With decades of TV industry experience and real world success, 
We know the ins and outs of the market like nobody else. To learn more about our TV consultancy services, head to 3vision.tv.